guys so welcome to tutor box live in conjunction with covid19 courses i am your english tutor box tutor so if you guys are here for my previous session then you know all about me if not then let me reintroduce myself so my name is andrea i'm a second year bcom law student studying at bits today we're gonna focus on poetry skills everyone i feel like a lot of students struggle with poetry um mainly like because of the language used or you know i'm um, getting the whole gist of the actual poem um it can be quite complicated and people often misinterpret the poem so i'm gonna help you guys with that i'll read to the theory notes with you guys um some tips on how to answer poetry questions and then i've incorporated two past poems from grade 12 past papers um that we'll just go through i'll read them through with you read the questions and then give you time to answer and then i'll go through the answers with you guys so poetry is like a huge part um of your paper if not a whole paper dedicated to poetry so um yeah i definitely feel like it's a huge topic to focus on and can definitely help you guys pass if that's what you want to do or if you want to get a really good mark to um, get in the course you want for university i'm gonna help you guys so guys don't be intimidated by poetry you know um you just gotta feel the emotion you know try get deep with the poems that you read become one with the poem so grade 12s today we're gonna mainly focus on figures of speech i just feel like it's definitely an important starting point to um be able to read poetry and also it really helps answer the question so even if it's not a direct question about a certain type of figure of speech you can still use it to explain other questions that they ask you know like mm, like what is the mood of the poem you can use a figure of speech used in the poem to explain um how this adds to the mood so yeah it's very very important for you guys to understand different figures of speech so we're going to start there and then the questions that are going to be asked in the poems that i've extracted um are going to incorporate figures of speech directly and indirectly so yeah i really hope it helps you guys please enjoy the lesson thanks Okay guys, so today we are focusing on grade 12 contextual poetry skills. So not essays or anything, just for this lesson, the contextual poetry skills. We're going to look at how to answer poetry questions, poetry terms to be familiar with that come up in exams, and some exercises. Okay, so um, how to answer contextual poetry questions. Poetry is supposed to evoke certain emotions. That's like the whole point of poetry. So even if the poem doesn't evoke any emotion from you specifically, it's important to be able to identify and show that you know at least what emotion the poem is trying to portray to the reader. First and foremost, you must read the entire poem to get a feel for the meaning of it. Don't rush through it, take it line by line, slowly just absorb it in. Um, a useful tip is to then go through the poem and highlight different figures of speech in different colours. It's important to then go through these figures of speech and decipher what they each mean. So this will give you a better understanding of the poem as a whole. Um, because I feel like students often just, often just read through the poem, um, see lines that they don't uh, understand and then just let it throw them off completely. So rather just take it in bit by bit. Um, if you know your figures of speech, it makes it a lot easier. You can just highlight it and then interpret it um, in your own way. Obviously, make sure it's the correct way. But there's lots of different ways to interpret poetry as well, at least. So, yeah, but the figures of speech, um, it's very important to just decipher what they mean. It'll give you a better understanding as a whole. So, for example, he's a walking encyclopedia. This is a metaphor, meaning that he's very intelligent. So if you, you know what I mean, so if you see that, if you see a metaphor, highlight it, write metaphor, and then try and understand what it means. You must translate figurative language into more literal language. So now we're going to move on to figures of speech and sound devices. 
Um, the definition of figures of speech is words, phrases, or expressions used in a manner other than their literal meaning in order to produce a special effect. Um, the definition of sound devices is where the sound of words is just as significant as the meaning of words. So now we're going to move on to the actual figures of speech based on comparison slash resemblance um, and the examples of these. So I'm also going to describe the function and why these um, figures of speech are used. So um, note that these are the figures of speech that are based on comparison slash resemblance. So a metaphor is calling something by name to an object slash person which is not literally applicable to it. The function of this, um, which you can apply when answering poetry, poetry questions, you know, it's important to know why poets use metaphors. Um, probably also the most common figure of speech, to be honest. Um, so metaphors makes the writer's experience clearer and more vivid and conveys a depth of meaning by calling up numerous associations in the mind of the reader. It makes the description more compact. Uh, a simile is, I'm sure you guys all know this, it's so common, but it is basically like a metaphor except it uses the words like or as. So it's a comparison between two things using like or as. The function of this is that it makes a picture more vivid and helps to convey more accurately how the writer experienced a sensation. Um, now personification is attributing human qualities to a thing or an idea. So the uh, function of a of personification is that it makes the scene more vivid or the action more forceful. So let's look at the examples now. Um, an example of a metaphor is that test was a breeze. Um, obviously, the test is not an actual breeze, um, like a gust of wind. But metaphorically, this means that the test was really easy. An example of simile is uh, that she's as small as a mouse. So she's not actually as small as a mouse, um, and she's not a mouse. But this just means that she's really small. Um, it's like a metaphor, but it uses the word as in this example. Um, personification, the example is that the clouds cried. Clouds cannot actually cry. This means that the that it was raining. Um, so crying is obviously a human quality, so and clouds are not human, they are things, so it's attributing this human quality of crying to uh, a cloud, which is a thing or an object. Okay, so moving on to figures of speech based on associated ideas. So the previous slide, uh, we talked about figures of speech based on um, comparison, now we are going to talk about figures of speech based on associated ideas. So the first one is a metonymy. You guys might not be as familiar as this um, compared to the previous slide. So metonymy is the substitution of the name of something for that of the thing meant. I know that sounds confusing. Um, so the function of this is that it may serve to emphasize a certain aspect of the person or object concerned. So next we have a, I'm not sure how to say it's the answer to you, I think it's Kinadosh, Kinadosh, something like that. So this is a part, is, this is when a part is named, but the whole is meant, uh, slash understood, or vice versa. So it can also be when the whole is named, but only part is meant or understood. So the purpose of this is that it may serve to emphasize the aspect which is selected, but often it is just a case of common usage. Um, so we use synodox like, quite often, but and we won't even know it. So yeah, it's common usage. Um, a hyperbole is an exaggerated statement. So it's really not meant to be taken literally. The function of this is that it, it, it expresses intense emotion and emphasizes the fact stated. Um, a litote is an ironical state, understatement, especially expressing an affirmative by the negative of its contrary. I know that also sounds confusing, but 
looking at examples will really help you understand it better. So it, the, the function of this is that it emphasizes the statement. Um, then our last one is a euphemism, which I'm also sure you guys are all familiar with. Um, this is a substitution of a vague or mild expression for, for a harsh or direct one. So, yeah, so basically the function of this is just to soften uh, your words so it doesn't sound so harsh or rude. So let's look at the figures of speech based on associated ideas, uh, the examples. So for metonymy, um, I'm just going to repeat the definition again. This is the substitution of the name of something for that of the thing meant. So when we look at the example, which is lend me your ears, it means like, this obviously implies lend me your ears means listening. Um, so the so instead of saying listening, it's substituted with lend me your ears, which implies um, that you should listen. So a synodoch is um, when a part is mentioned, but the whole is meant, or vice versa. But in this example, which is, I am going to fetch my glasses from the bedroom. Um, this is the example where a part is mentioned, but the whole is inferred or meant. Um, the part being mentioned is the actual glasses, which is like, so spectacles would be the whole thing. The glasses is just the glass inside your spectacles. So when you say, I'm going to go fetch my glasses, you don't just mean the little glass parts of your spectacles. You mean the entire, your entire set of glasses. So by the part is mentioned, but the whole is inferred here. Looking at a hyperbole, this is, the example is, I've been waiting for 50 years. This is an exaggeration. The person has clearly not been waiting for 50 years. They are just saying that this just means that they've been waiting for a long time. So uh, the example of a litote is, uh, you are not doing badly at all. Um, litote is a ironical understatement. So when you see this sentence, you are not doing badly at all, this means that you're doing good, but it's understated because you're saying you are not doing badly. Um, so it's a bit like uh, contrasting, you are not doing badly means you're actually doing good. So that's a little, that's little. Um, moving on to euphemism, the example here is her sister passed away. This is just a less harsh way of saying your sister died. So yeah. Okay, guys, so moving on to sound devices now. Um, let's look at alliteration. So alliteration is the repetition of beginning consonant sounds at short intervals of different words. The function is that it links important words and emphasizes them. It imitates sounds mentioned in the poem. It influences the rhythm, either slowing down the tempo or increasing it. So moving on to onomatopoeia. Um, this is forming the forming words from sounds that resemble those associated with the object or suggestive of its qualities. The purpose of this is that it imitates the sounds referred to. It helps to create a vivid oral picture and makes the scene more immediate and real to the reader. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds in two or more words without the repetition of the same consonant. Uh, the function of this is that it creates vivid oral images, oral images by imitating the sounds of objects mentioned in the poem. Okay, so the example given for alliteration is whisper words of wisdom. Um, the alliteration in this example is the W for, uh, w for whisper, W for words, W for wisdom. Um, moving on to onomatopoeia, the onomatopoeia in the example, the buzzing bee stung me on my lip is the word buzzing. Um, and then looking at assonance, the example is the engineer held the steering wheel. So the assonance here is the double E um, vowel sound. So the double E in engineer Steering wheel and wheel. So steering and wheel. So that's the assonance.
So now guys we're gonna move on to the last slide for our theory. Um we are gonna be looking at figures of speech based on contrast slash differences. So the first one we have is a pun. Um a pun uses the double meaning of a word or phrase. The function of this um is for suggestive and humorous purposes. A uh, paradox is a statement which is self-contradictory but contains some truth. The next one is an oxymoron. This is a paradox contained in two words. So it's, it's a paradox, but it's only made up of two words. So let's look at the examples. For a pun, this is to, when you use the double meaning of a word for suggestive and humorous purposes, um, the word here is stable. In the sentence, a horse is very stable. So the first obvious meaning is um, the definition of stable, which means like secure. And then the double meaning to stable is that a stable is where a horse lives. So that's how the word stable is a double meaning. Um, so yeah, it's used for humorous purposes. So moving on to paradox, this is a contradictory um, like statement. So looking at the example, which is one has to be cruel to be kind. The self-contradictory statement is that is the two words that you need to look at is cruel and kind. These are complete opposites, right? So now we're going to have a look at the last three figures of speech based on contrast or differences and in those examples. So um, sarcasm is a bitter or wounding remark, ironically worded um, or an ironically worded taunt. Um, the function of this is that it expresses feelings, serves to reveal the speaker's attitudes or feelings towards a person meant to address. So moving on to irony, uh, the definition of irony is an expression of meaning by language of opposite or different tendency. The function of irony is that it expresses the speaker's feelings and attitude towards the person or thing he is discussing. It is usually used to create humor. Um, moving on to innuendo, so this is when something is hinted at without actually saying it. So it's usually used because um, you don't want to say what you mean straight up, like out front. You'd rather say it in a way that's like kind of hidden, but so that the other person will know what you mean. Um, but yeah, it's usually also less harsh. So now we're going to look at the examples of the last three um, figures of speech. So the example for sarcasm is, that's just what I needed today. So this person who is saying this, obviously means that that's not what they needed today. Um, so maybe somebody else was being rude to this person and in response this person said that's just what I needed today. Obviously meaning that's the opposite of what he needed today. So that is sarcasm, a bitter or wounding remark. So looking at the example for irony, it is the name of Britain's biggest dog was Tiny. This is ironic because you would expect the name of Britain's biggest dog to be something like Buster or something related to the word huge. Instead, its name is Tiny, which is ironic because it's completely opposite um, to the actual dog, which is huge. Then moving on to innuendo, the example is Elijah has been spending a lot of time with Joanna. So this is kind of implying that maybe Elijah and Joanna are dating without actually saying it, but if you say this to someone, they'll pretty much know that you mean that Elijah and Joanna are dating. So it's sort of just suggestive. Slam, poetry, yelling, angry, waving my hands a lot, specific point of view on things, Cynthia, Cynthia, Jesus died, for our Cynthia's, Jesus cried, runaway bride, 
Julia Roberts, Julia Rob Hurts. <laughs> Cynthia, mm, Cynthia, you're dead. You are dead. Bop, boop, beep, bop, bop, boop, bop. You're dead. That's for Cynthia. She's dead. Well done, guys. You have made it through the theory. We are now going to go on to some exercises from the past papers. Actually, before we move on to the exercises, I want to do a little fun activity with you guys um, based on figures of speech. But I think it's quite a cool thing. So we're going to do that first and then move on to the exercises. <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot going on in this picture, but the first one that I spotted was Time Flies. Um, there is also Born with a Silver Spoon in his mouth, Hit the Nail on the Head, um, Bird Brain, um, Spilling the Beans, and then, so where it says a figure of speech on the image, above it and below it is a nut. So that wasn't very obvious to me at first. Um, so that could be like a hard nut to crack. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, he wears his heart on his sleeve. Uh, keep your card close to your chest. So like be secretive, I think. Or like, yeah, keep your, um, keep personal, basically. Um, he's got an ace up his sleeve. Um, uh, the cat's got his tongue. He's got cold feet. Um, piece of cake, and then also at the bottom there, in the bottom right corner, it's piece of cake and cherry on top. Um, then his socks are down, so that could be like pull up your socks. And the bucket is for the figure of speech, pick the bucket. So the other one for um, hit the nail on the head, um, the nail could also represent loose screw, like you have a loose screw in your head. Um, the fish could be something fishy. Uh, the cheese, I'm not really sure, but I just thought of one. Maybe it's cut the cheese, but I don't know. Um, let me see what else. So uh, the fish could also be fish out of water. Then by his hand, his right hand over there, he's got like some knots. So that could be tie the knot. He's got the cat by the tail. Um, then also like his clothes are a bit raggedy at the bottom and he has fancy clothes on top so that could be like rags to riches, you know, and then um, the cracked egg on the floor, I'm not really sure but it could be you have to crack an egg to make an omelette, then the shadow, 
that could be like living in his shadow. Um, what else is there? Oh, the other nut one could be um, in a nutshell. So like, because the, the title, A Figure of Speech is like in the nutshell. So I think that might be it. Um, but yeah, okay. I don't know if I mentioned all of them. If you got any other ones, then just let me know in the Q&A. Um, that's going to be at the end of the session. So, yeah. We're going to do some jazzercise that'll keep you fit and smiling, sugar. Okay, guys. So, for the exercises, we're going to read this poem and answer the following questions. So, I'll read the poem through with you guys. Um, I'll read the questions, give you some time to answer them. And then I will go through the answers with you. So the poem is Remember by Christina Rossetti. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning to stay. Remember me when no more day by day, you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me, you understand. It will be late to counsel then or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while, and afterward remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave, a vestige of the thoughts that I once had, better by far you should forget and smile, than that you should remember and be sad. So question one is, what is the tone of the poem for three marks? Question two is, why does the poet repeat the word remember? For two marks. Question three is state and explain one example of personification in the poem for two marks. Question number four is explain what the use of the phrase the silent land in line two conveys, conveys about the speaker's state of mind for two marks. And the fifth question and the final question of this poem is does the poet make use of euphemisms? If so, state what they are and explain them for three marks. The first question, which is, what is the tone of the poem? Um, I think the reason why it is for three marks is because it's important to note that the tone changes throughout the poem. So for about the first half of the poem, the tone is adamant on the reader or the person she is speaking about not forgetting her. So she is very fearful that he will forget or she will forget her, the speaker. And then... Like halfway through the poem, it changes because uh, she has sort of come to terms with the idea of this person forgetting her. So it starts off adamant and then becomes more relaxed, I would say. She is also, you can also mention that she is contemplative about the idea of death. She is not afraid of death. For the second question, the poet um, intentionally repeats the word remember. Um, because it is a command for the reader to not forget her. So she's very adamant about uh, not wanting the reader to forget her. It just ingrains this in the reader's mind that they must definitely remember her. So for question number three, um, I can spot two examples of personification. The first being Silent Land in line two. And the second example being For the Darkness and Corruption Leave in the fourth last line. So you can choose either one and explain it. For me, um, Silent Land is easier. This just means that the place you go after you die um, is being de described as quiet um, because, you know, once you die, you don't make any noise. You go to the Silent Land. 
Then for the um, line that says, for if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that I once had, um, you can just explain that it's personification because darkness and corruption are uh, ideas or qualities that cannot actually leave a vestige of thoughts behind um, because, you know, leaving is a human quality and darkness and corruption is more so an idea of something. So the answer for number four is that the silent land is used euphemistically for the death slash the afterlife. And this is based on your interpretation of it. So um, she might be fearful or apprehensive of the unknown and the isolation. Or if you want to look at it the other way, then you could say she might be fearful of being alone and forgotten, which in my opinion, that's what I would have said. Um, the speaker might also see death as a mysterious and eerie, as mysterious and eerie. Alternatively, she might see it as a peaceful escape from her pain. Again, I would go for the latter, which is she might see it as a peaceful escape for her pain. Um, I would just say this rather because to me it seems quite calm, like she has embraced the concept of death. She's not really scared of it to me, but again, it's based on your interpretation. So you could take it the opposite way as well. So that's what's nice about poetry is that you can interpret like kind of the way you want to as long as you can explain properly. So I've spotted two euphemisms, the first being um, gone away in the first line and the second line. And then the second line being silent land. So silent land would be a euphemism for the afterlife or the place you go when you die. Um, whereas gone away is an actual euph euphemism for physically dying. So instead of saying um, when I'm dead, you say when I'm gone away. Um, into the silent land instead of saying like empty void or something like that. Okay guys, so um, for the last poem, I know um, you guys have it as part of your syllabus. So I'm not going to read it through with you. I'd rather just read through the questions with you and answer them. And yeah, so you can read through the poem on your own time. I'm sure you have already. So I'll just go through the questions and answers directly and just um, answer them immediately rather than giving you time to answer them, just so that you have the answers and that you can look through them whenever you want. So here is the next poem, which is The Zulu Girl by Roy Campbell. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go through the questions and give you the answers right now. So we can gather um, from the diction in stanza one that the setting slash environment is a hot landscape where laborers work. Um, you can see this through diction such as um, the sun being hot red, the word smolder, um, the word sweating, uh, the gang and labor implies that this is um, the way the laborers work. And yeah, you can just tell that it's extremely hot and people are exhausted. So it's definitely a hot African um, land setting slash environment. So question two says, refer to line 11 through his frail nerves, her own deep language ripple. Discuss the significance of this description in the context of the poem for three marks. So the answer is that the act of breastfeeding not only provides nourishment for the child, but also transmits to him the mother's feelings and attitude. The word languor suggests that the mother is wary and despairing of the situation that she's in. It might suggest that the mother transmits her strength uh, to the child so that one day he will free his people from oppression. So she is very tired of being oppressed. That's obviously being transmitted through the breastfeeding to the baby. Um, so because she is so tired and fed up with this oppression, she is also hopeful that her son could maybe end it. So that's what's being transmitted through the breastfeeding. Question three is find and explain a simile in the poem. Um, so I found three, which is line 10, hugs like a puppy, grunting as he feels. Um, so just tugs like a puppy is a simile in line 10. Then in line um, 17, her body looms above him like a hill. And in line 12 as well, like a broad river. So through his frail nerves, her own deep language, ripple like a broad river. Those are the similes that I have found. So because the question is asking to just find out and explain a simile, which means one simile, um, I'm going to explain the one in line 17, which is her body looms above him like a hill. 
This means that the mother is metaphorically, metaphorically becomes a hill that overshadows a whole village. She technically uh, metaphorically protects all oppressed children um, by looming over her own son like a hill. She's no longer just the mother of the child that she um, of the child that she has, but rather she represents all the mothers of all the children of the oppressed. The word looms over him like a hill. Um, it just shows that she is the protector. So the final question is, how does the onomatopoeia in line 8 add to the metaphor used in uh, line 8 for 4 marks? So line 8 is, prowl through his hair with sharp electric clicks. The metaphor here is um, prowl, um, which is describing the mother prowling through the son's hair. So this is a metaphor because uh, it's referring to the mother as a fierce animal, um, which shows a protective nature of a mother. Um, the onomatopoeia used in line 8 is the word clicks. This is a hard and sharp sound. Um, because of the word clicks, the fact that it's such a hard and sharp sound, um, it adds to the metaphor because of the fierce animal. Um, so, you know, hard and sharp links with fierce, protective animals. So it just adds to the metaphor and the imagery of this mother that is being described as a fierce animal. Okay guys, so that concludes our lesson for today. I really hope it helped you. Um, if you have any questions, anything you don't understand, we're going to have a Q&A session now if you want to join. Um, so yeah, just ask any questions that you want. Don't be scared to ask questions and I'll help you out the best that I can. It's not a matter of whether or not we can. Everybody can, but not everybody will. How to turn nothing into something. How tangible are ideas and imagination? Ideas that become so powerful in your mind and your consciousness, they seem real to you even before they become tangible. Imagination that is so strong that you can actually see it. You can actually see it. If somebody cannot see it when it is not here, then it will never be here. Start looking into the future of what you would like to accomplish, and where you would like to go, the person you would like to be. Decide what you want and then act as if you already had it. And that is to believe that what you imagine is possible for you. So the first step is to imagine what's possible. Second step, to believe. Now here's the third step. And that is to go to work and make it real. You now go to work and make it a movement. You make it tangible. You make it viable. You breathe life into it, and then you construct it. You have a lot to offer. The fact that you're still here means that your business is not through yet. People don't do what they know in life, but what they do is they operate within the context of the vision they have of themselves. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. Make up your own rules. 
The rules on what is possible and impossible were made by people who had not tested the bounds of the possible by going beyond them. You must change what's possible for you. You and only you are the subject that impacts the burning desire in your imagination. You are living and feeling as if your future dreams are a present fact. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. So you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to develop yourself. As long as you're breathing, you've got some more work to do. There's something else for you to achieve. Guess what? You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. So now go and make interesting mistakes. Make amazing mistakes. Make glorious and fantastic mistakes. Break rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. Make good art. It is possible to start with nothing and become something.